Hello, and welcome to the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. If you're just discovering Path Forward, we're delighted to have you with us today. If you've been joining us regularly throughout this series, welcome back. After signs of progress in our public health earlier this year, we are once again facing a crisis in our nation's fight against COVID-19. As the Delta variant spreads across the country, cases are spiking, hospitals are filling up, particularly in areas with low vaccination rates. Despite these challenges, we have received some good news recently. Study after study continues to prove that vaccines are effective in protecting against severe cases and hospitalization from COVID-19. And this week, the FDA granted full approval of the Pfizer vaccine, hopefully clearing the way for individuals who were waiting to get the shot. The Chamber has been helping businesses decide whether and how to implement vaccine requirements, and this FDA approval will help businesses keep their doors open and keep their customers and employees safe. Our top priority is to ensure the tragedy and lockdowns we experienced earlier in the pandemic do not happen again. Joining us to discuss the recent rise in cases due to the Delta variant and what this all means for America's recovery efforts is Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy. As the nation's doctor, Surgeon General Murthy commands a uniformed service of 6,000 dedicated public health officers aiding the most underserved and vulnerable populations domestically and abroad. He is no stranger to this role, having served previously as Surgeon General during the Obama administration, where he helped lead the nation's response to a range of health challenges, including the Ebola and Zika viruses, the opioid crisis, and more. He has been tireless in his mission to restore trust by relying on the best scientific information available, providing clear, consistent guidance and resources for the public, and ensuring that we reach our most vulnerable communities. Welcome, Surgeon General. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad we're doing this, Suzanne. Yeah, me too. So, so let's start with the broadest question possible. What is the current state of the pandemic and where are things headed as we enter into fall? Well, Suzanne, so let's talk about the, the good news and the tough news, right? The, the good news is that we have over 200 million people in our country who have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Really, really good news. Uh, those are people who are far more protected uh, against COVID than they otherwise would have been. Uh, the good news also is that we're seeing vaccination rates uh, increase, actually, compared to July and June. Uh, in fact, the states that have been hardest hit by the Delta surge are the ones in which the vaccination rates are going up the fastest. Uh, so all of that is good news. But the tough news is that we are in the middle of this fourth wave spurred by the Delta variant, which is the most transmissible, the most contagious version of COVID that we've seen to date. And so that continues to be a challenge for us. I think uh, what's also important to know about the, the Delta variant is that it is what is driving not just cases going up, but an increase in hospitalizations as well. You know, we are nearing, uh, as we speak today, uh, 100,000 people uh, who are in the hospital, which is extraordinarily high. Um, while still not as high as our January peak, um, it is still incredibly high and speaks to just how powerful this virus is. And what it's important to know also is that the, the vast majority of people who are hospitalized and losing their life to COVID-19 are those who are not vaccinated. And what worries me uh, very much is that we have around 85 million or so Americans who are not vaccinated. Many of them uh, you know, are not vaccinated because they have still have questions about the vaccine. Maybe they've heard misinformation about the vaccine and they need to talk to somebody they trust to dispel those myths. Uh, we also have many children who are under 12, including my own kids uh, who are too young uh, to have a vaccine available to them. And uh, they rely on the rest of us around them being vaccinated to protect them. So we have a ways to go when it comes to getting our population fully vaccinated and protected against COVID-19. But we should feel good about the incredible progress we've made in a short period of time. Again, almost 170 million people fully vaccinated, close to 200 million plus uh, people who have gotten at least one shot of the vaccine. Again, that's a lot of protection against a virus that we just really came across uh, less than 18 months ago. Well, I'm, I'm certainly, was so proud of getting my second vaccine. I remember you know, wanting to, to, to sing songs and have a parade. It was it felt like <laughs> such a joyful day. Uh, but, speak, but things that aren't so joyful, right, is that we're really seeing overwhelmed 
hospitals again. And so, you know, I wrote down this quote, Oregon's governor warned the public that, quote, there may not be a staffed bed for you if you have a medical emergency because of the sudden increase. And so how worried are you about the strain on the healthcare system and the capacity? Suzanne, I'm incredibly worried about our healthcare system and about our healthcare workers. You know, even before the pandemic began, Suzanne, doctors and nurses were struggling with a very high rate of burnout uh, and a high rate of suicide in the, in the medical profession as well. And then came COVID, which was like the hurricane that comes and hits you and just stalls and sits over you and continues to dump rain on you. And that's how many doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals have felt throughout this pandemic. There was a first wave, then the summer wave of 2020, then the winter wave, and now the Delta wave. And putting all of this together, uh, you know, what we've seen is that as hard as uh, they are, are working, as much as they are doing, our doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and other healthcare personnel, they're, they're running out of gas. You know, they're running on fumes, really. And, and that, that worries me for so many reasons. One is because you know, they matter and they've been our heroes during this larger COVID response. And, uh, and we need to take care of them the way they've been taking care of us. Uh, but it also worries me because you know, we, we need our healthcare workers not just to take care of those who may get COVID in the days and weeks and months ahead, but also to take care of all the other medical conditions that people come in with, heart attacks, pneumonias, infections, uh, and other conditions. So we are at risk. Uh, of compromising our ability uh, to care for our population if we do not do something about the burnout and the exhaustion that we're seeing in our healthcare worker profession. The most immediate step that we can take is to try to get people vaccinated quickly because the one thing that's been consistently true from the beginning of this vaccination effort is our vaccines are holding up and they're keeping people out of the hospital. They're saving lives. Uh, even though we've seen uh, in, in recent weeks to months, an increase in the number of mild and moderate breakthrough infections, which parenthetically is one of the reasons why we are going to start doing booster shots at the end of September, we are still seeing that the protection is holding up uh, against hospitalization, severe disease, and death. So that is the most important step that we can take to help decompress our hospitals, to save lives, and ultimately to help save our healthcare workers who are really struggling. You make such an important point about the healthcare workers. I was talking to the CEO of a big hospital system the other day who talked about nurses retiring at record rates at this moment. And so the nationwide worker shortage is another piece of this puzzle kind of made worse. And yet, you know, what you just said, which is one of the ways to reduce overcapacity at hospitals, the burnout of workers, et cetera, is to keep people out of the hospital, which the vaccines are effective at doing. And so why are we having such a hard time getting people vaccinated? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it is the question of the moment, Suzanne. And I, I think if you look at the, the just a real world experience we've had these vaccines, it's, it's very clear, especially to those of us in medicine and public health, that this is one of the most clear cut ways that you can save lives is to get people vaccinated, like no question about it. Sometimes there are close calls uh, in medicine and public health. This really is not one of them. Uh, the vaccines really do save lives. And so we know that, but I think there are a couple of things happening uh, that have made it challenging to get more people vaccinated. This, and even though that we've done a remarkably, uh, I think, fast job in getting 200 million plus people with one shot in, we want to go even faster than that. Because again, every person who's not vaccinated is somebody who's at risk uh, of COVID-19. So a few things I think that are playing into the, the ongoing challenge, though. I think one uh, is that there is a tremendous amount of misinformation out there about the vaccine and about COVID more broadly. There are still people uh, that we encounter today who think that COVID's not real or who think it's no different than the flu. Uh, both of those are not true. There are also myths circulating that the vaccines uh, against COVID cause infertility or mutations in your DNA uh, or that uh, somehow they cause COVID itself. And none of those are based in fact or science at all. But they continue to circulate aided and abetted by social media platforms and other tech platforms. So that stands as one of the profound challenges that we face. And it's partly why two thirds of people who are not vaccinated say they either believe those common myths or think those myths might be true. So we have a profound challenge when it comes to misinformation. The other challenge we have, as I think of it, has to do with motivation. Uh, there's some people who have absorbed uh, the, the message that somehow because they're younger, that they don't need to get vaccinated, that COVID's not really a problem for them. 
And here's what we know. We know that younger people and, and our kids do much better uh, with COVID than senior citizens do. And thank goodness, you know, our, our kids, uh, you know, do, do better. But that doesn't mean that COVID doesn't impact children. In fact, we've lost hundreds of children to COVID-19. We've had thousands of children hospitalized. We have a record number of, of kids hospitalized at this moment with COVID-19 more than at any other point during the pandemic. And what that speaks to is the fact that even though our kids do better, that doesn't mean that COVID is benign. It doesn't mean that it's harmless in our children. And we have an opportunity to take a risk to our kids and make it even lower from COVID with the benefit of the vaccines. We've got to do that. Uh, but I think that that is one of the things that that notion or perception somehow that uh, the young people don't have to worry about COVID-19 that prevents, I think, younger people also uh, from getting vaccinated. And finally, I would just say, Suzanne, look, we've known, uh, to say the obvious from the beginning of this pandemic, that uh, there, there has been a, a polarization and a politicization uh, of the pan pandemic that has not served us well. Pandemics are times when science has to guide us and when we should all come together from various walks of life, including political uh, positions, uh, people you know from across our country. We all need to band together in the face of a common enemy, which is COVID-19. And I think we're still dealing you know, with the legacy of that, that polarization. So all these factors together, I think, have slowed us down in some cases on the vaccination effort, but we're not giving up uh, by any means. And in fact, we're redoubling, retripling uh, our efforts to reach those who are unvaccinated, in particular, working to mobilize and, and engage with and support trusted messengers in communities, whether those are faith leaders or local business leaders or local doctors and nurses and others, recognizing that at the end of the day, it's the people you trust who can make the biggest difference in your decision about getting vaccinated. Information alone, uh, the message alone isn't going to change uh, people's decision. It's the message plus the messenger that ultimately matters. That's such an important point. And I really want to underscore your idea that it's a civic duty. It's not just about protecting yourself as an individual, but protecting the country, protecting children who can't get vaccinated, uh, protecting healthcare workers, et cetera. It, it really is a civic duty. Let me give you an opportunity to bust another myth because one of the myths has really been that these breakthrough infections are proof that the vaccinations don't work. So can we bust that myth right now? It's a really good question. So let's talk about what breakthrough infections are and let's talk about what the vaccines were uh, designed to do what their most important job is. The most important role the vaccine plays is in saving your life, in preventing you from ending up in the hospital. And by that measure, these vaccines have worked remarkably well. The Pfizer vaccine, vaccine the Moderna vaccine, and the J&J &J vaccine. So if you got any of those three vaccines, you should feel good that your chances of ending up in the hospital or dying from COVID are much, much, much lower uh, than they would have been had you not been vaccinated. But what we do see uh, with vaccines from time to time is that people can get mild or moderate uh, infections, and those are called breakthrough infections. But there's a difference between, again, mild to moderate breakthrough infections and the severe uh, breakthrough infections or hospitalizations that we worry most about. Uh, so that's a, that's a really important distinction to make. So we also know that with vaccines in general, that over time, uh, they start to, to lose some of their efficacy and their protection. And that's one of the reasons why we have many vaccines that require more than one dose. Like take the hepatitis B vaccine, which many people have gotten, which is a three dose series. You get uh, a dose at you know, time zero, and then at one month, and then at six months. Uh, there are other vaccines like tetanus, which require boosters. So we know that periodically, uh, sometimes you need an extra dose of the vaccine uh, in order to ensure that it continues to be protective. So we feel good about the protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Uh, and we want to keep that protection going, which is one of the reasons a couple weeks ago we announced that we would plan to administer booster shots uh, on the on September week of September 20th, uh, in pending the FDA's uh, weighing in and thorough review of these extra doses and the CDC's advisory committee weighing in as well. Um, but we want to keep that protection going. So the bottom line is you are going to hear about people who got vaccinated and maybe have a mild infection with COVID or who are asymptomatic, meaning they don't feel anything, but they happen to test positive on a, in a routine surveillance test or because they were in contact with somebody who had COVID-19. And that doesn't mean that the vaccine has failed. In fact, we know that when breakthrough infections happen, they're far, far, far more likely to be mild uh, or, you know, compared to what they could have been otherwise. So 
Uh, just think about the vaccine as a tool that is knocking down COVID in terms of its strength. Uh, most of the time, it won't be able to come near you. And even if it does, uh, you might get away with a simple scratch, you know, versus if you didn't have the vaccine, you might have much more damage done to you. Speaking about uh, reasons to be optimistic that more adults will choose to get vaccinated, uh, the FDA just granted full approval to the Pfizer vaccine. And the hope is that may get some people who were reluctant kind of over the fence. What does that mean? Could you explain to the audience what this full approval means and when the other manufacturers might receive similar approval? Yeah, that's a really good question, Suzanne. And let me also talk about what the approval does not mean, because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion about what these approvals are. Uh, the FDA had already evaluated the three vaccines, the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines uh, earlier, uh, in, in fact, at the end of last year and then early part of uh, 2021, and had given them what was an authorization to be used, called an emergency use authorization. And they issued that because they believed that the benefits of the vaccine outweighed any risks associated with the vaccine. Now, that decision has been borne out and actually uh, proven to be the right one because we have seen time and time again that any risk of rare side effects with the vaccines is far, far outweighed by the benefits people get uh, from vaccination, which is to prevent COVID in the first place, especially the worst outcomes of COVID. The full approval uh, is sort of another process that the FDA uh, goes through well, with a vaccine where they review uh, literally thousands and thousands of pages of data from the clinical trials, from the real world experience of giving the vaccine. They look at the manufacturing uh, process and uh, make sure that that has integrity to it. They put a whole all of these factors into consideration and they give a gold standard, a gold stamp of approval, if you will, uh, and say, OK, this uh, this gets the full approval for the FDA uh, based on a review of safety uh, as well as effectiveness. And so that's now what we have for the Pfizer uh, vaccine. But uh, here's what doesn't really change. Uh, it, it doesn't change that the vaccines, all three of them, have still been shown to work and that we recommend them strongly under the authorization given earlier from the FDA. It doesn't change the fact that we likely will still need uh, boosters the week of September 20th, which is when we're planning to start them because of the start, we're starting to see a waning in protection over time for people who've been vaccinated for many months. Uh, so it doesn't change that. What I do think may happen as a result of the full approval for Pfizer is that some people who were waiting uh, for full approval to make their decision uh, may you know, come off the fence now and say, OK, I'm ready to get vaccinated. I think that'll be a, uh, a small portion of the population, but every person matters. And I think the other thing that you may see is more businesses actually uh, feel comfortable with putting vaccine requirements in place. We know that many businesses and universities already have put requirements in place, especially uh, healthcare organizations uh, that, that actually deliver uh, care and need their healthcare workers to be vaccinated. Uh, but I think that there were a number of businesses that were saying, well, maybe I feel more comfortable about this if I just, uh, you know, once the, the full approval is granted. And I think some of those businesses may feel emboldened uh, to, to take that step. And lastly, let me just say this, you know, about these requirements, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, should you put these requirements in place? Should you not? I think it's happening more and more. I think that that pace uh, of, of requirements going into, in, into place in workplaces will only increase. And I think part of it is because when I talk to employers in particular, especially about what to consider when they're trying to bring people back to the workplace, what to think about uh, in terms of how to create the safest environment for their customers, they're thinking about safety, right? They're thinking, how can I make sure my, my workplace is as safe as possible? How can I make sure my workers feel as comfortable as possible coming back to work and know that we are taking all steps to protect them. And how can I make sure if I have clients coming into the office or customers, that they also feel uh, that this is going to be a safe place uh, for them to come and to engage with our services. So for all those reasons, I think the vaccine requirements make a lot of sense uh, for businesses to consider and to put in place because it does reduce, uh, you know, increase the safety uh, rather of, of workplaces. It reduces the risk. I think to business owners who, again, may worry, you know, about what will happen if uh, if folks get sick, you know, in the workplace. Not only does that, you know, cost somebody their health and detract, you know, from productivity, but it can also send a signal, you know, to other people in the office that, hey, this place isn't as safe, perhaps, as it needs to be. Thank you for that, doctor. And I do have a couple more employer questions since that makes up so much of our audience. But before we head there, uh, let me ask you this while we're talking about vaccines. 
when do you think the vaccines will be approved for children ages 12 and up? I think there are a lot of parents in the audience and a lot of employers who are eager for the kids to be safe uh, to get their workers back as well. Yeah, it's such a good question. It's a personal question for me because I have two kids under 12 and I'm uh, eager uh, for them to get vaccinated, but we don't yet have a vaccine authorized or approved for that age group. Uh, look, I hope it'll come soon, but there are a few steps that have to happen. Number one, the trials are underway right now in kids under 12. Those trials have to be completed. Then the data has to be analyzed by the companies and then an application submitted uh, to the Food and Drug Administration, to the FDA. The FDA, I know, will work at breakneck speed to get that assessment done because the vaccines for COVID-19 are the top priority uh, for the FDA. And, uh, and they, will, they will put that, uh, again, at the top of their list. Uh, but they've got to get that data first. You know, if everything worked out well, in an ideal scenario, could we have a vaccine for kids under 12 before the end of the calendar year? It's possible. Uh, we could. But again, all of that has to go right. And it depends on certain decisions that companies and the FDA have got to make over the next, uh, you know, several months about, uh, again, about how quickly they can submit that data uh, and about what kind of authorization versus approval they're looking for. And until then, I should just say, Suzanne, like if you're a parent out there like me who's got young kids and you're trying to think, gosh, how do I keep my kids safe uh, during this time until that vaccine is available? Uh, a couple of things I would just uh, remind you of. Uh, one is that the environment that our kids are in uh, is what affects their risk, right? So if they're around people who are vaccinated, if everyone in the household get vac gets vaccinated, that significantly reduces the risk to our children. Uh, number two, think about where your kids go, where they spend their time. Uh, are, are they going to uh, out to eat at restaurants with others in crowded settings where the burden of virus is high in the community and they're not wearing masks? Well, that is a, uh, that is a higher risk activity for our kids to take. So thinking about how to ensure that when they're getting together with others who are outside their household, that they're trying to do so outdoors or in well-ventilated places and that they're keeping masks on when they're indoors, uh, that's also very helpful. And, and finally, just if you've got you know, again, kids under 12 who are going to school uh, as well, just remember that you know, the measures, the layers of protection that are important in schools that the CDC laid out are all the more important now given the Delta variant spreading so quickly. And that means, you know, making sure our children are wearing masks to fit them well, that they know how to actually put on and that they keep them on is important. It means that the ventilation uh, in our schools and regular testing in our schools is also important. Something that you should ask your school administrator about if you haven't had a chance to talk to them or if you're not sure what precautions are being taken. So there are steps we can take to keep our kids safer. It's all the more important with Delta, given how many children we're seeing are ending up in the hospital. Uh, and we will work as hard as possible uh, to get that vaccine for kids because my kids, all of our kids, uh, they've got to be part of the population that we protect against COVID-19. Thank you for that. And, and, and let me let me go back to the employer uh, questions for a minute, given how many employers are in our audience today. You know, employers have done so many things to try to get their uh, workplaces vaccinated, their employees, their team members vaccinated. We've heard of bonuses. We've heard of drawings. We've heard of uh, companies starting to say the opposite. You could pay more for your health care if you're not vaccinated. So carrots, sticks, bonuses, access, vaccination clinics. Is there anything employers are missing? Can you think of anything else the business community could do to encourage people to get vaccinated? Well, well first, I just want to say a big thank you to so many of the leaders in the business community and the companies out there that have really taken such an incredible and I would say even unprecedented initiative here uh, to help people get vaccinated. You know, the, the, the president and the many members of the team like understand just how vital uh, workplaces are and employers are to making sure that we move forward as a country and protecting people against COVID-19. It was one of the reasons uh, that the president really pushed for a tax credit for businesses that were giving time off uh, to employees for either them or for their family members to get vaccinated. Uh, it's why we worked hard to get free transportation also earlier in the vaccination effort so that people could you know, have lower barriers to access to actually getting that vaccine. Uh, so I think when we think about what's going to work to get people vaccinated. I would think about three buckets as you think about the folks in your workplace. You know, one is, uh, you know, the bucket that has to do with access itself, you know, whether it's, you know, having a hard time taking time off, whether it's getting a ride to places getting vaccinated, whether it's figuring out where to go to get vaccinated, which you can now thankfully do easily in vaccines.gov. These are all common things that we hear uh, prevent people from going in, including the challenge of childcare. And so whenever there are steps that you can take 
uh, to help uh, people overcome those barriers in your workplace, they can be incredibly helpful. We had built partnerships with Kinder Care and Bright Horizons and many other uh, child care providers, uh, you know, earlier in the vaccination effort for them to provide free child care uh, to people who were looking to go out and get vaccinated. But we're going to need ongoing efforts like that. The second bucket I would think about is motivation. You know, rem- there are, some, again, some people out there who just don't think it's that important for them to get vaccinated. Maybe they've been, uh, they've had COVID before and they think, gosh, I got sick before. I'm protected. I don't really need uh, to get immunized. But we know uh, that people can get sick again after they've had COVID-19. We know that just because you got sick with COVID earlier, uh, with, the, with the prior variant circulating, like the alpha variant or the pre-alpha variants, that that doesn't necessarily mean you're protected against the Delta variant. So reminding people again that uh, who may not think it's important for them to get vaccinated, that it actually still is, is really important. And to me, that falls in the realm of education, you know, that we've got to do uh, for folks around, around vaccines. But finally, I'll just say this point around um, requirements is also, I think, an important one. You know, there are a lot of people who, um, you know, who sort of, you know, bristle against the idea of requirements. But the notion of having requirements for safety in the workplace is not new, right? This is something that many employers I know are familiar with, especially for healthcare workers. They're used to having to get certain vaccines, for example, in order to work in the in the workplace, like the flu vaccine, uh, for example. So uh, to me, these are steps that we take to protect not only our workers, but the people who come into our workplaces, including our customers. Uh, I think they are very reasonable uh, steps to take. And, you know, the Department of Justice, uh, you know, has weighed in on this in terms of the legality of these requirements. It says that is that is certainly appropriate. And I think with the approval, uh, you know, a full approval of the Pfizer vaccine, I think workplaces can feel even more comfortable uh, that those kind of requirements uh, are the right thing to do. You know, one of the challenges is that we are facing such a massive worker shortage in this country. And I know that there are employers that are afraid that if they mandate this vaccine, they're going to have an even harder time holding on to their workers. So if you were looking you know, right into the camera and talking to some of these business leaders, what would you say to them? Well, it's a, it's a really good point. And, and I know that when you're running a, a business and I, you know, I had the privilege of, of building and running a technology company for a number of years before I served uh, as Surgeon General, I know that the, the, your employees and the talent that you bring in, uh, that's, that's your gold, right? That's the most important asset that you have. And uh, to lose uh, talent uh, you know, is a huge loss and a huge cost uh, for, for a business. Uh, but I would also consider the, you know, in addition to thinking about how um, people may react negatively uh, to a requirement for vaccines, I would also think about the flip side of it, which is how employees may react to a workplace that they don't feel is sufficiently safe uh, for them. You know, we're already starting to see these these rumblings, you know, in some businesses that I speak to, which are trying to bring employees back, uh, employees have questions, like, how do I know this is going to be safe, especially if they have young kids who are unvaccinated at home, or if they have people who are vulnerable or immunocompromised at home, many are unwilling to come into a workplace or uh, into a place of learning where they feel that they aren't adequate protections, where they feel like the people around them uh, aren't vaccinated. So I would strongly consider that as well. Uh, you know, and in and, and the end of the day, I think that history will judge us well uh, for the steps that we take to create safety, uh, safe spaces for our kids to learn, for people to work, uh, for clients to get services. And that's where I think the, the, the vaccinations are eminently justifiable. Will it cause some short term uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, tumult, if you will, like, you know, as, as we all figure this out, yes. But I think there's a cost to inaction as well. Uh, and I think more and more, like, we, we know that there is a large portion of the workforce that is already having doubts about coming back uh, to working in person, that has questions about how to make sure their family is taken care of as they try to come back uh, to some sort of work life. Uh, I think it's really important at this particular moment in time that employers uh, look at that broader picture and try to do every, try to do everything they can uh, to make sure that the needs of their employees are met. And I do think that the vast majority of employees want to want to know their workplace is safe and that they don't they're not going to bring infection back uh, to the people they love at home, especially if they're not vaccinated. So let me ask you a couple of follow up questions we get from employers all the time. So, you know, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we talk to small businesses and large businesses all day, every day. And our foundation has done a lot to try to educate those communities and and chambers of commerce across the country on best practices here. We're really hearing two types of questions right now. One is, okay, I've decided to mandate vaccines. 
but I guess I just take people's word for it. You know, is there, how do I get my employees? Is it self-attestation? And so what, what, what are you seeing as best practices for employers who have decided the right thing for them is to mandate the vaccine? Well, that's such a good question, Suzanne. And, and this is actually a rapidly evolving space, uh, you know, in terms of the vaccine verification, uh, where in the private sector, we're seeing more and more initiatives uh, to create uh, verification tools so that small businesses can uh, have an easy way uh, to understand either whether it's for their customers or their staff, what their vaccination status is. Some states have, have moved even more quickly than others. There are states like New York, for example, which have um, the Excelsior Passport, have, have, they have tools for verifying vaccination. There, New York City also has built out some additional tools. So uh, by contacting your, your local Department of Health, uh, you can always talk to them to see if there are tools that are particularly available in your state. But I anticipate there are going to be more and more uh, tools available as more businesses and universities uh, start to put requirements in place. The demand for a verification tool is growing. And these private sector initiatives that we know are already underfoot, I think, are just going to gain more steam in the days ahead. You know, one of the, the kind of related issues is so many industries were really sucker punched last year when they couldn't have large in-person gatherings. And that included associations that were used to having big trade shows, you know, and the businesses that could attend and meet new clients and have new sales and network. And, and the hope was all of that returned this fall. And so I think the whole business community is looking at that quite warily. So what do you think? Will we be having large in-person events throughout the fall? Gosh, it's, it's such a good question. I remember having this conversation literally at this time last year uh, with people. I used to, prior to serving in government, I spent a fair amount of time at conferences and large gatherings. And, uh, you know, it, it felt very, uh, just very strange to all of a sudden uh, disband all of those. We're trying to train the virtual. And I know this time last year, we thought, well, maybe by this, you know, a year later, we'd be back to those things. I think that the, I think we very well could have been had it not been for the, the Delta variant and for the surge that it has uh, led to. And so, look, I think, you know, the people I think in general are going to be uh, probably reluctant for a little while, especially when we're, in the, when we're in the throes of this surge, to get together in large numbers uh, in indoor spaces. Uh, I think that there are measures we can take to reduce risk in indoor spaces like wearing masks and for gatherings like ensuring that folks are either tested uh, ahead of time or that they <clears throat> uh, or, or that they also have a vaccine verification uh, sort of in place. All of those things can reduce the risk uh, to people who are coming. But I think, you know, at a time like this, especially when we know uh, that when folks have breakthrough infections that they can potentially spread uh, COVID-19, I can understand that like some folks are going to feel reluctant. Uh, to get together in, in large gatherings. And, and so I think we may have to wait a, a little while longer here. Uh, but again, the, how long we have to wait really depends on what we do with vaccinations. Like the faster we get people vaccinated, the more quickly we can return to some semblance of normal, in, which will include getting together in large groups and having the kind of gatherings that we enjoyed prior to the pandemic. You know, another big group of questions we get, particularly from employers, whether they're getting people back in their workplace or thinking about in-person events, is what are we supposed to be doing about masks? The guidance feels confusing. And so what, sh what should we be doing as human beings inside and outside the home, at work, at school? What are you as the Surgeon General recommending on masks? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, one of the most challenging parts, Suzanne, of this pandemic has been uh, keeping up uh, with the recommendations, right? Because as the pandemic has evolved, as we've learned more about the virus, as new variants have come onto the scene, uh, the recommendations have had to evolve with that science. But that is, that's made it, I think, challenging for, for people to keep up. And so in terms of masks, here's the latest that you need to know. Uh, if you are unvaccinated, you should absolutely be wearing a mask. Uh, wherever you go outside of your, your household in terms of indoor spaces and when you're in really crowded outdoor spaces uh, for a long period of time. If you are fully vaccinated, uh, then you know, the risk to you is far, far less uh, than it is if you're not vaccinated. But given that we know uh, that some portion of people may get breakthrough infections and that if they get them, they could transmit them to others, the CDC has recommended that even vaccinated people wear masks when they're in indoor spaces. Now, you might ask, 
what you should, what's really the point of getting vaccinated if I still have to wear a mask indoors, just like an unvaccinated person. But keep in mind, the purpose of getting vaccinated is to save your life and keep you out of the hospital. So that even if you do have a breakthrough infection, you're not likely to die from it, uh, you know, and much less likely so than somebody who's not vaccinated. So that's the purpose of the vaccine, but continuing to wear masks in indoor spaces uh, would be the right thing to do. Because again, you could inadvertently pick up the virus and transmit it to other people. Now, if you are at home and you've got children or who are unvaccinated, or you've got uh, other people who are immunocompromised at home, and you might be wondering, well, what should I do differently? Well, I think it's all the more important in those circumstances to make sure that even if you're vaccinated, that you're wearing a mask when you're gathered with people in indoor settings outside of your household. Uh, as like, I'll tell you what I do, like uh, is when I go to the grocery store, uh, if I have to go to, to indoor meetings uh, with, with other folks, I wear a mask. I wash my hands carefully. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, and I do that so that when I come home, I don't have to wear a mask with my children. I can be you know, mask-free with my family. So those are some steps I would take. I'd finally say, if you, as you're considering the workplace and, and what to do with masks there, um, you know, there too, again, because most workplaces are in indoor settings, uh, even when people are vaccinated, having them masked is, is often the more cautious way to go. Now, these, this guidance can evolve, you know, as again, hopefully as we get the Delta variant more under control, as more people get vaccinated, uh, if we wear masks and help reduce transmission, and we may be able to get to a better place, you know, where we can uh, change that guidance around masks. But for right now, just given how uh, widely the Delta variant is spreading, given the fact that people with breakthrough infections can transmit, it's important for us to be cautious and to use those masks, especially when we're in indoor spaces outside of our house, regardless of our vaccination status. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I think we'd also love some similar straight talk about testing. I think people are really confused about how often they should be tested or when they should be tested. And, mm -hmm. and, that, and that goes to children too, or travel policies. And so can you give us some straight talk about testing? Yeah, so really glad you asked about this as well. You know, it's funny, we don't hear that much about testing in the news, right? Because so much of the focus is, and you know, rightly so on uh, the terrible hospitalizations we're experiencing, the surge in cases uh, and on the vaccines themselves. But testing is a really underappreciated strategy that you can use to make workplaces much safer. And you know we've seen this already uh, crop up in the federal government, for example, you uh, may have heard a few weeks ago, pres the president announced that there would be a requirement for wor federal workers to either get vaccinated or to test you know, at least once a week uh, and then provide the results of that test. Uh, so a regular testing cadence once a week, in some cases twice a week, these can be helpful strategies to ensure that you are catching people uh, you know, and, and I'm sort of tracking them, isolating them, removing them from the workplace where they can infect others uh, before it's too late. Uh, there are different types of tests you can use. There are what are called antigen tests as well as PCR tests, which are, uh, you know, so the PCR tests sometimes take a couple of days to do or, or up to sometimes they can be done within 24 hours. But the antigen tests, many of them are uh, quick tests, rapid tests that you can get 15, 20 minute results from. Uh, using either of these tests, actually, at a regular cadence for what's called surveillance testing uh, is a very effective step in making workplaces safer. It's actually the same step that the CDC recommends for schools. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, there are many schools out there which are now doing weekly testing uh, for their students uh, because that is, again, one way to catch the infection early and before it spreads uh, to other people. So if you can do te regular testing, I would recommend it. Uh, in your workplace if people are coming back and, and gathering in person. And again, it's just it's one of those layers of, of, of safety that most people don't don't think about, but which is really, really helpful uh, in reducing the chances of infection spread. But to make sure I understood what you just said, you're talking about testing unvaccinated people, employees, not vaccinated. Yeah, so the most important people to test are, are, are the unvaccinated. Um, we know that that's where uh, you know, again, the greatest chance of infection is. Um, I know that there are some workplaces that have made a decision that they're going to test everybody, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And that's not an unreasonable thing to do, given that we know that breakthrough infections do in fact happen and that with the Delta variant in particular, uh, and at this particular moment in time, we're seeing uh, more mild breakthrough infections. Again, the challenge with breakthrough infections is, is less so to the person getting the infection, it's more so to the people around them. 
uh, because we, we do have a sense now that people who have breakthrough infections can transmit. So again, it's reasonable if you want to include everyone, but the most important population to be testing regularly is the unvaccinated. Thank you for that. And, and, and doctor, we do have a few uh, audience questions and I think some of these get back to vaccine uh, myth busting, which is one of our goals here. Uh, let me read you this one. Can the people who got the J&J &J shot take the mRNA vaccine booster? Mm -hmm. Really good question. And that's actually a question that there are studies underway right now that are looking to address. Uh, we call them mix and match studies, uh, but they involve looking at someone who got one kind of vaccine and then later got a dose of another vaccine. And this that includes someone who got a J&J &J and then later got an mRNA vaccine like the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines. So while we're not formally recommending that at this moment, uh, we are studying that. And as soon as that data is available, the FDA will quickly consider it to make a recommendation on that. My hope is that th those studies will be uh, not like positive and, and because you know we do have other studies from the past uh, that were done in the UK, which showed that using an mRNA vaccine after the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a vaccine kind of like the, the cousin of the J&J &J vaccine built on a similar adenovirus platform. But we know that, that that combination of doing that AstraZeneca vaccine followed by the mRNA was actually quite effective. Uh, in boosting immunity. And so it's very possible that that will be the case uh, for the J&J &J vaccine as well. I certainly hope that's the case. That would give us more options. But as soon as those studies are done, again, the FDA will look at it and then we'll be able to make a recommendation on those that approach to boosting. Here's, here's another audience question. Is the full approval of the Pfizer vaccine for the exact same vaccine that's currently being used, the approval letter has a different name than what is currently used? Uh, really good question. So it is actually for the same vaccine. It's not for a different version of the vaccine. And so the idea is you would get the same vaccine uh, in three doses, you know, of the Pfizer vaccine or with the Moderna booster, it would be three doses of the Moderna vaccine, uh, the same one that you got the, for the first two doses. So yeah, it is the same one. And the good news is that the, you know, the, the booster studies the preliminary evidence that we've seen, you know, indicates that they cause a real significant increase uh, in the antibodies uh, in, in your system. And those antibodies, again, are those are the soldiers and the broader army that your immune system is building with the help of the vaccine that will help fight COVID when it comes in. And even preliminary data uh, that we've seen from uh, Israel, where they have actually been administering uh, booster shots, uh, has actually demonstrated not only a significant increase in the antibody count, but a reduction and infections. And that latter part is what you really care about, right? Because sure, you can measure antibody counts, but the real thing you want to know is, is it keeping me safer? Am I going to be healthier if I get that booster shot? And the preliminary evidence from Israel is yes. Here's a, another audience question, doctor. Is there any aspect of ongoing research that leaves you concerned about adverse long-term health implications from authorized vaccines? Oh, well, good question. Well, right now, what we've seen, uh, you know, for the data from the vaccines is the safety profile remains really, really strong. Uh, that is good news. Uh, there are some rare side effects uh, that the FDA uh, has noted, uh, side effects like myocarditis with the mRNA vaccines, or uh, there were some rare blood clots that were seen with the J&J &J vaccine. But again, these are rare. And interestingly enough, when you get COVID-19, you have a far greater chance of having complications with blood clots and with myocarditis and other heart, heart uh, conditions. So that's a really important thing to know in terms of, so we feel pretty good actually about the overall safety uh, of the vaccines. It's just important to realize that, to put the, the, the side effects you hear about in context and to recognize that there's nothing that's 100% safe, right? Even taking Tylenol uh, or you know, ibuprofen over the counter, that has side effects as well. Uh, and if you just read the fine print on the bottle, uh, you will clearly, you know, see what that list of side effects are. But whenever you take a medicine or a vaccine, you're making a risk benefit calculation. Uh, do the benefits outweigh the risks? That's a simple question that you're asking. That's a, the question that your doctor is trying to help you navigate. And one of the things that's very clear with these vaccines is that the benefits far, far outweigh uh, the risks of rare side effects. No, I think turning a little bit from physical health to emotional and mental health, we're all hearing a lot about and feeling a lot of the emotional and, and mental toll of this pandemic. 
you know, a year and a half into it. And so again, speaking to the employers in the audience, what could we be doing to help our communities, you know, develop resilience and protect their kind of emotional well-being at this time? Well, I'm really glad you asked that question because that is the silent cost of this pandemic that I think doesn't get talked about enough, uh, that doesn't get addressed nearly enough. And that's the impact on the mental health and emotional well-being of people all across America. You know, when we when I talk to people everywhere, when I look at, you know, certainly look at data, uh, you know, that tracks how folks are feeling, the amount of anxiety, depression, exhaustion and loneliness uh, that folks are experiencing is really profound. It doesn't always bubble up, you know, into public view, but it is a price that we have paid during this pandemic that we will continue uh, to pay long after the pandemic is over, unless we recognize it right now and take action. So what can we do? Well, as an employer, simply recognizing to start that there is a mental health cost of this pandemic is so important. There are many employees and workers who hesitate to come forward and talk about their struggles because they think that they will be seen as weak uh, if they if they talk about the fact that they're having a tough time, or they'll think that they will be more likely to be perhaps cut, you know, from the workforce, or that it may be punished in some other way. Knowing from an employer that you see them, that you care about them, you recognize how hard this pandemic has been, that goes a long way. The second thing I think that employers can do is they can ask employees how they are doing in a real meaningful way, in an effort to gather uh, data about where people are struggling. Like, are there parents who are really worried about their kids going back to school? Are there uh, folks who have elderly relatives at home or people who are not vaccinated and they're worried about coming back to the workplace because they may bring infection to them? Uh, are there people who are worried uh, that they may lose their job because they've heard about others who have lost their job during the pandemic? Understanding where people's anxiety is coming from is so important and you can only do that by asking. Um, I will also just say the mere act of asking conveys the first point, uh, which is that you care, uh, that, you, uh, you, that you're concerned about these issues. And I think the third thing to consider is what kind of mental health supports uh, you offer to people. We know that it is often more challenging for people to get mental health care in terms of counseling services than uh, it often is for other physical health ailments. And so whatever you can do working with your, uh, you know, with your HR teams, with your employee resource groups, with your, uh, the, in, the companies that insure uh, your workers to make sure that they have access uh, to mental health providers and care is really important. What we don't want is a scenario where people are having to wait months and months and months to get an appointment when they really have an, an acute need. Um, and the final thing I'll, I'll just mention, of them, there are many things that we can do uh, in the workplace, and I uh, would be happy to dig into this in more depth if anyone's interested. But one other that I'll mention to you is are the steps that we can take to create more social connection in the workplace. Now, why does this matter? Here's actually why it matters, because we know that people have become, uh, many people have become more isolated and lonely during this pandemic. But we have also found through wonderful research from Sigal Barsade at, at, at the University of Pennsylvania, Wharton School of Business and others, that loneliness comes with a cost, that it actually negatively impacts creativity and engagement in the workplace and can have spillover effects on productivity and retention. And so this is a really important issue, the issue of isolation and loneliness for uh, folks who are employers and thinking about how do I make sure that I not only optimize the output of my workforce, but also optimize retention and make sure I have a workplace that is healthy uh, and thriving. And so there are steps that you can take to actually strengthen social connection in the workplace. And you know, typically when we think about that, we think, well, why don't we have more company picnics or happy hours? And yes, those can help a bit, but I actually think it's more often the, the culture that we build around connection and supporting one another. It's the opportunities we create in our meetings uh, for people to learn a little bit about each other and to build connections with one another can act, that can actually make uh, the difference you know, between how connected people feel uh, and how disconnected uh, they, they truly are. Uh, and you know, so consider some of these as you think about the, the workplace. And there are, there are plenty of examples of small tools uh, that you can introduce in, into meetings of how to add a little bit of structure uh, you know, and, and you know, to your meetings and to your engagements with, the, with your workforce uh, that can actually help cultivate uh, strong, much stronger social connection. 
The bottom line, though, is mental health is going to be a driver uh, of productivity, of retention, and of overall well-being in our workplaces going forward. That was true before the pandemic, but is much, much, much more true, especially given the, the strains that the pandemic has placed on workers. Well, we're going to take you up on your offer to come back and talk more about that. And I think the emotional impact on children and teenagers, you know, even my daughter's pediatrician came right out at our checkup to say what a hard time people are having. So that would be a good follow up for us to have. But let me ask you a question as we wind up here, you know, um, not being a doctor, not even playing a doctor on TV. I look at all these facts and I don't know what to do with them. Right. I look at these rising transmission cases, these full ICUs, uh, potential new variants. And I, I don't know if I should be scared and pessimistic that this is going to get worse. Or if I could say, look, these vaccines work. We're going to get more people vaccinated. We know what to do. Wash our hands, wear a mask, socially distance. We're going to get through this. Let me end on an optimistic note. Looking at all of these facts and, and actually being a doctor, um, what makes you optimistic at this point in this fight with this pandemic? Well, Suzanne, that is the right note to end on because I, I feel optimistic that we will get through this pandemic. I feel optimistic that we know what to do uh, to get through this pandemic. And, you know, there's a huge difference between last year and this year. You might think to yourself, gosh, last year we had a lot of cases and now we're seeing a lot of cases. Last year we had a lot of people in the hospital. Right now it feels like we have a lot of people in the hospital. What's really all that different? I'll tell you what's really different is the fact that we have vaccines now. It has made all the difference in the world. Uh, the reason that we have so many people uh, who are not getting sick and who, are, you know, if they have breakthrough infections or seeing very mild infections is because they are vaccinated. And that was not true last year when we did not have anything to look to, uh, to really protect ourselves other than masks and other mitigation measures. The other thing that makes me optimistic though, is we've learned a whole lot more about this virus and how to prevent its spread. Like at the very beginning of this pandemic, I don't think we fully recognized just how important the ventilation would be to reducing the spread of the virus. We always knew that ventilation, sure, it's important, but with COVID, we've seen just the profound difference between indoor and outdoor spread. And that's really due to ventilation. And so the efforts that now are taking place in schools and workplaces to improve ventilation are ones that are going to help us make our workplaces safer. And the also availability of testing is very different now compared to this time last year when we were really struggling uh, to get an adequate volume of tests, especially rapid tests. But the fact that we have them means that we have a way to wake our, make our workplaces and schools much, much safer uh, than we otherwise could last year. So these are all reasons to be optimistic. I know we will get through this pandemic. I do think that how quickly we get there, though, depends on what we do between now and then. So number one, get vaccinated if you're not vaccinated. That's the best way to protect yourself. Number two, remember that wearing a mask and taking safety precautions around mitigation, avoiding unnecessary risks, this is important at a moment like this when we were in the midst of a profound Delta surge. It will help reduce uh, the spread even further. And third, remember the power of talking to your family, to your friends, to the people who trust you, whether those are the folks uh, in your workplace or whether those are people in your community more broadly, uh, because it is those trusted relationships that give us the power to help people make the right decisions for themselves. Right now, there's a, there, you know, I really, you know, as a doctor who's counseled many patients on many health decisions over the years, I believe everyone has a right to make their own decisions. But I also think that people have a right to have accurate information so they can make those decisions uh, based on what facts, you know, so then and ultimately make the decisions best for themselves and their families. But right now, there are a lot of people who uh, have been disempowered by the fact that they don't have uh, the truth about what's happening. They've heard myths and they may have bought into those myths. And what they need to, to do is to hear from people they trust, uh, people like you. So think about the folks in your life who may not be vaccinated, the family and friends uh, you may have, the folks maybe in your workplace. I just recognize that it doesn't matter if you don't have a nursing license or a medical license, you can have a profound impact on their health and well-being by helping them understand the truth about getting vaccinated, the importance of get vac getting vaccinated. And if you're an employer, your ability to make that easier for them to do by helping knock down some access barriers, uh, that's yet one more step you can take. Uh, to ensure that workplaces and our communities are safer. So those are just a few things that we can do, but these are all the reasons why I feel optimistic because I know there's a part all of us can play 
I know we have the protection of these vaccines. We are in a much better place, even though we're still in a tough place. And if we keep going uh, and focus on this vaccination effort, we will get to the end of this pandemic, hopefully sooner rather than later. Well, we do all have a part to play and businesses want to play their part. We want to keep our doors open. We want to keep our customers and employees safe. Uh, you know, we don't want to go back to lockdowns that are so damaging to emotional and mental health and to our economy. And so I hope you'll continue to call on us and, and use us as a megaphone to get these important messages out. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Murthy. No problem, Suzanne. Thank you. And just a big thank you again to all of the employers and businesses that have joined today, and most importantly for what you've done over this last 18 months. You know, I, I have been really inspired by so many of the organizations that I've seen that have really stepped up in incredible ways, not because somebody mandated that they had to, but because they knew what the right thing was to do, that protecting their workers, protecting their community was just important from a standpoint of moral leadership. And I do think that our business community, uh, you know, many of them have been those moral leaders in the past. We're gonna need you. Uh, to continue to be those kind of leaders in the future to keep uh, workplaces and communities safe. But just have deep appreciation to you for everything you've done during these incredibly uncertain times, especially when the livelihood of many businesses and the health of our economy you know, has been under threat. So just a big appreciation for your partnership. Thank you. And thank you for all your work. We appreciate it. We'll look forward to having you back. And to all Thanks, of you, sir. thank you so much for tuning in today. We will share details on our next program soon. Uh, in the meantime, if you haven't yet, please get vaccinated. If you know someone who isn't vaccinated, take the time to help them make a good decision. It could save a life. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon.